This job aid is designed to help you differentiate and identify soil horizons in the field. After viewing this video, you should be able to follow the National Cooperative Soil Survey methods to independently identify soil horizons, their depth, and boundaries between them, and understand the observation method used to describe soil horizons. When describing horizonation, the most important items are just basics, which you already know. Describe and record what you see. We're interested in trying to capture the main layers or horizons or stratigraphy that we find in any exposure. The larger the exposure that you have to make observations, the better job you're going to have in understanding the context of what it is you see. So when you find large exposures like this, take full advantage of them, road cuts, basements, pipeline banks, whatever you can find, because that helps explain what you see in much smaller sampling that you typically get out of a pit or out of an auger hole. When you first look at a, at a site and try to begin to evaluate it, most people are interested in picking out the obvious things. You want to pick out color changes, because they're usually the easiest to see and focus on. The last thing you want to do when you're done is actually label the horizonation. Many people will do that first, and that's unfortunate because you'll bias yourself and not see things or pay attention to things that you should. So start with a clean slate, save the horizonation naming to the end, and just focus on the layers and the features that you find. So if you look at this site, we've got a number of different zones, and you can see color differences. There's something dark up top, it gets brighter and grayer as you come down the face. Then you have a chocolate brown layer in the middle. You have something gray and some stones down here and these white seams. Those are easily separable into major layers. You split the major layers first because you can come in later and then subdivide into minor layers based on other attributes, whether it's coarse fragments or changes in rooting habit or whether soil changes in structure. But the main layers are the ones you want to get first. Get the easiest ones. And you can come back in later and subdivide. And then as you work through each major morphology character, structure, color, coarse fragments, rooting uh, patterns, uh, clay skins, presence or absence, all these different descriptors they will add to the body of information that at the end you can use to give a good solid defensible nomenclature for those different layers. Before you get started in the field, take the time to review the sections of the soil survey manual on designations for horizons and other layers. Refer to the field book for describing and sampling soils, focusing on the charts and discussions for the observation method, master, transitional, and common horizon combinations, horizon suffixes, other horizon modifiers, horizon depth, and horizon boundary. The most up-to-date nomenclature for describing soil horizons will be found in the current edition of the Keys to Soil Taxonomy, Chapter 18, Designations for Horizons and Layers. As you review these references, notice the observation methods recorded for disturbed, undisturbed, wall and or floor. Also notice that the horizon boundaries is described with a distinctness and topography. Depths and thicknesses should be recorded in centimeters. The most important thing to do when describing a soil profile is to describe what you see. In a large exposure here, like we have, um, it's very obvious to see gross morphology such as soil structure. It's very easy to see soil color and root distribution patterns. So the breaks that were placed by these red pins mark horizon boundaries that were separated on this morphology that's very obvious. Here we have platy structure. Here we have angular blocky structure and a difference in root distribution. This horizon boundary was placed here because we have an abrupt, smooth boundary between this horizon and this horizon. This horizon has the beginnings of what we call prismatic structure, where we have elongated peds. 
as does this horizon, which is much browner. You can see this horizon has a different color than this horizon, so this was broken out based on color and on structure. As we proceed down through the profile, the, the structure becomes much larger. We get coarser sized and longer um, prisms. This boundary here was placed because of the size difference in the prisms between this horizon and this one. It was also placed because we see a difference in redoxomorphic concentrations or these, these reddish orange um, masses of iron and manganese which are distributed in the profile. And then farther down we have a lithologic discontinuity at this break between another parent material and the structure is obviously different. It's not as um, well expressed down in this horizon as it is up in here. So as we, as we make these, as we separate the horizons with these initial breaks, then we have to look at the PEDs more closely to look for soil features such as clay films or secondary calcium carbonate and the redoxomorphic features which are evident in place in this horizon but in some horizons you need to remove PEDs to observe them. So the horizon boundaries can be adjusted as you examine the soil more in depth. In the case of these horizons here we know that there is alluvial clay that has been redistributed from the surface and alluviated or moved in solution down into these horizons. And it's obvious when you remove some of the prisms and look at their, at their faces, there are coats of clay on the faces of the PEDs, which are described for each horizon that they occur in and the presence of those clay films is one of the pieces of evidence that you use to identify this as a master B horizon and their little suffix T uh, indicates that there's alluvial clay present. The horizon designations that we gave to the part of the profile that we see here is um, A, master A, and um, two master A horizons, both of which have been disturbed by plowing, so we call that an AP1, and this horizon is an AP2. The plowing is the reason that there is an abrupt smooth boundary here between this AP2 and this BT1 horizon. This horizon here we designated BT2, this a BT3, and this a BT4. There was no calcium carbonate present in any of these horizons. They were non-effervescent throughout as we used hydrochloric acid to test for the presence of carbonates, and there was none. So, and there's none, no car calcium carbonate that's visible as secondary features. So there's no suffix K on any of these horizons, but they do have clay films present. So every one of these B horizons is a, is a BT, a BT1 through BT4, so there's a vertical subdivision with depth. And then at this pin here, we have a lithologic discontinuity to the next um, body of soil material, which is present from here down for about another meter. To differentiate horizons, start with what is most obviously seen, such as strong differences in color, structure, amount or type of fragments, abundance of roots, and other features that readily stand out. Place markers where your confidence is highest in distinguishing between horizons. Modify and or refine the locations of these markers with what you can feel, such as differences in texture or consistence. Also modify and or refine the locations of these markers with what you can measure in the field, such as pH, effervescence, and the electrical conductivity. Most horizons and layers are given a single capital letter symbol. Some require two letters, as in the case of transitional and combination horizons. The Keys to Soil Taxonomy contains the most up-to-date definitions of master horizons and their lowercase letter suffixes, numbers, and symbols, and the conventions for listing these when used in combination with each other. Review this data, focusing on horizons typically used in your survey area.
It is important to understand that genetic horizonation does not necessarily equate to diagnostic horizons in soil taxonomy. Designations of genetic horizons express a qualitative judgment about the kinds of changes that are believed to have taken place in the soil. Diagnostic horizons are qualitatively defined features that are used to differentiate between taxa. A diagnostic horizon may encompass several genetic horizons, and the changes implied by genetic horizon designations may not be large enough to justify recognition of different diagnostic horizons. An experienced soil scientist can help you with the proper application of vertical subdivision of master horizons, recognition and description of discontinuities, and the use of the prime and caret symbols when applicable. The same can be said for recognizing and describing horizon boundaries in terms of distinctness and topography. Be sure to discuss alternative horizonations as possibilities and ask questions until you understand the horizon label descriptions. This job aid is designed to help you differentiate and identify soil horizons in the field using the National Cooperative Soil Survey standard methods. As with any new skill, proficiency comes with practice. For more information and tips on describing soils, please see our online NCSS training materials.